Thanks very much, and I'm sorry I wasn't. Um, well, I, I will act. I will actually embarrass Tim and say that he only asked me to do this last week. Well, that's the same as everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I'm sorry to have just landed at the end of the day because I said, "Oh, I no, can no, only I do." I said, "I can only do half past four. So I'm, I'm sorry for everybody else who's presented. If I've missed your presentation, it's not an arrogance. It was just not having not having time to do it. Um, just uh, yes, I ran the co-op farming business for 11 years, but I'm actually a production engineer by training. And I spent um, uh, seven years at Mars Confectionery um, in, in marketing. And then um, I've also spent four years at Anchor Foods, which is now Fonterra, um, also in marketing, but also in sales. So from my point of view, you know, having 11 years in total of working in fast moving consumer goods and 11 years in farming, um, when I knew about this role coming up, um, I actually thought this would be a fascinating thing to do um, and, and was very keen to do it, partly because I found nothing more frustrating as the inefficiencies that we actually have in the, in the food chain um, with um, um, many suppliers who I meet. They say if a retailer asks me to jump, their response is how high, not what are you trying to achieve and what's the most efficient way of both of us trying to achieve this. Um, and uh, so it was what an area I wanted to get into. And it was also frustrating being in the co-op where I took the whole business into packing that we grew, grew potatoes, broccoli, strawberries, apples. We packed all of those things and we sold them all in the retail stores. And I wasn't able to get an efficient supply chain joined up so that we actually promoted products when we had a lot of them. And we didn't promote products when we had shortages and all that sort of thing. So I felt there was so much to be gained. But, um, anyway, so the, 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 the um, yeah. you don't need to read this. It was just for me to remember what I was going to say. But um, my view of the market, therefore, having come at it from being quite experienced uh, uh, being in the chain, is that we've actually made the uh, grocery supply chains extraordinarily complex, um, partly because the retailers um, used to buy a product from you at one price and sell it at another price. And that was where they what the money. The difference in those two was where they then work, you know, took money to, to run their business and made a bit of profit. Whereas um, now, so in some cases, up to 50% of all of the income that, that's, that retailers are getting is actually from other ways of getting money out of, out of suppliers. Um, to some degree, you know, not all of these things are permitted by the code, but to some degree they were taking money by, by telling you to use a preferred packaging supplier. And uh, they would then take a cut out of the packaging supplier for being my preferred packaging supplier. And then all the, everybody that wanted to buy packaging for your potatoes or whatever else then had to pay a premium for it. They would also maybe try and make money out of um, charging you for doing some audits. Or they might, um, in some cases, um, just come to you at the end of the year and say, uh, we, we've, um, you know, a, a buyer might say, I've missed my target in my category by two million pounds. Your share of my category is 25%, so you owe me half a million pounds. These are the sorts of things that were sort of that the retailers were just finding lots and lots of other ways of trying to take money out of the suppliers. And, and you know, I suppose they were trying to get the money eventually back into price, but they were then making it very complicated. And of course, if you're a supplier and you're asked for half a million pounds, your, net, your, your reaction, as we're all trained to do, as I trained my buyers to do at Anchor, is when you're asked for something, try and get something for it. Try and get this new higher margin product listed. Try and get a bigger distribution for this. Try and get something back for the money that you're actually giving them. And of course, by both sides doing that, you just made this thing ridiculously complex. Um, and then what comes along is you get the discounters who will have, um, on average, I don't know if you know about these things, but on average about 3,000 lines, whereas Tesco at the moment is on an initiative to reduce its number of stock keeping units from 90,000 to, to 60,000. I mean, you know, that probably includes their electricals and some clothes and things as well, but it gives you an idea of the difference in the way that they're behaving. And, and the, the simplicity of the way that the discounters are working, where they're ordering full pallets of things and they are um, giving, you know, they will negotiate for two weeks a year and they were hugely aggressive negotiators, really getting the price absolutely rock bottom. But once they've done that, they'll leave you alone. And you d then get on with trying to work out how to do my job as efficiently as I can. So I think that the new challenges of simplicity and efficiency have actually made a difference. And there's another, another theme, which, which is that on the um, innovation front, that 
because it, it was sort of deemed actually one of the reasons that the, co the groceries code was all set up in the first place um, w was about the concern that if too much risk is being passed by retailers to their suppliers, um, that small suppliers would go out of business and larger suppliers wouldn't innovate because they didn't really, they couldn't predict anything. And it's interesting that certainly when you speak to people in the engineering profession, that they will say that the innovation in food manufacturing in the likes of Germany and Spain is way ahead of what we do in the UK in terms of use of robotics and all of that sort of thing. So, so you know, from an innovation point of view, I think we are seeing an impact of it. And yet, of course, that's the last thing the retailers want because they want to be able to get products made as efficiently as they can, as near to their market as they can. So these, these sort of things have, have come along, and this is sort of my view of it, but the Grocery Supply Code of Practice, which I don't expect you to read that, um, uh, was, became law in uh, February 2010, and that was after probably a decade, and some people will say even more, of lobbying from people saying we need to do something. Um, there were two competition commission inquiries, one in 2002 and the other one 2006 to 2008, where the competition commission were trying to establish if, is there a problem in this chain. In 2002, they said no, there's no problem, because as you probably all know, the comp competition commission or con con uh, competition and markets authority now only have one role in life, and that's to make sure that the consumer isn't disadvantaged. And in 2002, they thought that actually the, uh, the, the consumer was doing very well out of it. In 2006 to 8, that was when they came up with the view that maybe if small people went, small businesses went out of business and larger businesses didn't innovate, then we will end up with less choice for consumers. That is the whole remit behind where the role came from. It's about giving consumers choice. It wasn't about whether the dairy farmer's being paid enough for his milk. It was coming from protecting consumers. And the code of practice itself it has an overarching principle of fair dealing, fair and lawful dealing, but it has 15 practices underneath which are deemed to be uh, um, against the law, which are against the law. Um, I don't, we don't call them unfair trading practices in the UK, but the European Union does. So if you actually think about it, that's what it's nothing to do with price. It's got nothing to do with whether, you know, if you've agreed to supply something at 28p and it ends up costing you 30p and you can't negotiate a price increase. That's got nothing to do with what the code is. The code is about doing things like telling you you've got to use this packaging supplier and the retailer taking a cut out of it. It's about... Um, um, overcharging for customer complaints. Um, if you take back a bag of apples to your retailer and say one of the apples was bruised, very often they will give you a bag of another bag of apples and your money back. But they, what they will also do is they'll look at the barcode on the product and they'll go all the way back to the people who, um, who grew it and they will charge them £45 for the fact they had a customer complaint. Um, but under the code, they are not allowed to uh, overcharge or make a profit out of the cost of customer complaints. They can't ask you for retrospective lump sums. They can't ask you um, to um, predominantly fund a promotion. Now, what does predominant mean? Not really sure. But at the end of the day, the majority of what the code is about is unless it's in the supply agreement and you've agreed this up front, then you can't bring in all of these other ways of, of, of trying to make money out of suppliers. And I'll come to some real, real live examples in a minute. Um, the website's there, it's got all of the code on it. These are the 10 retailers covered by the code. It was defined by the, um, the, the Office of Fair Trading when it came in um, as uh, the re retailers with a grocery turnover of over a billion. Um, you may sort of be interested to know that there actually are some, some retailers actually are coming up to that level in groceries turnover. So, so I think ultimately there might may be more people that will get covered, that will come under the code. But it's also the direct suppliers from anywhere in the world to those 10 retailers that are covered by the code. So it's about retailers treatment of their direct suppliers. It's got nothing about the direct suppliers treatment of the retailers. And there's quite a few of the retailers point out to me that some of their suppliers are bigger than them. But it's all about how the retailers treat their direct suppliers. It is also nothing to do with how the direct suppliers treat their indirect suppliers and all the way down to the bottom of the chain. It is just about that relationship. Um, that, is, that, is presumably, well, that is where the Competition Commission found that there was a, a need for intervention from the consumer point of view. But also the way the whole thing is set up 
is that um, my office is funded by a levy on these 10 retailers. So it's effectively a tax. Um, uh, and therefore, you know, it therefore makes sense that it is about the re those retailers and the relationship with their direct suppliers as opposed to uh, further, further down, down the chain as, as it's all been set up now. The, my role started in June 2013. So as I said, the code became law in February 2010. That huge gap in between was because the retailers were asked to voluntarily put in, to have a voluntary ombudsman to oversee adherence to the code. Only one of those 10 retailers agreed to do that, and I'll give them the credit because that was Waitrose. The other nine all said they didn't need it. Um, so therefore they had to go to primary legislation to create my role, which of course takes time. But interestingly, I mean, it actually started before the coalition. I was called, a, it was called an ombudsman before, and then when it changed parties, it became an adjudicator. But it, essentially it went through all, with all party support. Um, and my, my role is to monitor and ensure compliance and enforce the Groceries Supply Code of Practice. Um, I can't change the code. I can make recommendations to the Competition and Markets Authority if I think that the code is lacking in some way. I can't decide who's covered by the code. That again comes from the Competition and Markets Authority. But I, my office, I am a corporation soul, which makes me sound like some sort of fish. But anyway, there's just me, and then I have secondees from the civil service to, who, who work for me. So we're independent. Um, our, parent, our parent government department is biz, but we're independent from them, and we're independent from the CMA as well. That second part is actually what I've said I want to do, which is to help strengthen the supply chain and bring further innovation, benefiting suppliers, retailers and customers. You know, that I, I'm, as I said, I'm coming at this role as a, out of a passion for sufficient, efficient supply chains. Um, so in terms of, of, of the, 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 the legal powers that I have been given, um, I'm, I, um, I have two main legal powers. One which is, is, is in arbitration and the other is investigation. But the way that I have been working from the start is in a more collaborative way where I have been um, um, collecting uh, anecdotes from suppliers everywhere I go and taking them up informally with the retailers, each of which has to have a code compliance officer who's not allowed to be in the buying chain of command. So they tend to be in legal or in audit or one of them's in finance. Um, and I have quarterly meetings with all of those people. Um, I have two meetings a year with all of them sitting in the room together and I have been um, working and then every one of those quarterly meetings I have been raising what my top issues are and they're having to report back what they've actually done to progress. So the majority of what I have done since I started the role is in, is in an informal um, way. Um, an arbitration is when a supplier has got an issue with a retailer, they took it to the code compliance officer and the code compliance officer was unable to resolve it, in which case they can come to me to arbitration. Arbitration is effectively a legal process and it is costly. Um, I have been trying to say to all the code compliance officers to, to make sure they resolve everything they can because once it comes to me, the retailer picks up my costs unless it's deemed that it was vexatious, but I can also award compensation to the supplier. So it could actually be a very expensive bill for the retailer, but worse from my point of view, very time consuming and outcome and everything in it is totally confidential. So I'll do a huge amount of work and nobody's going to benefit from it apart from one, one, one supplier potentially. Um, I have got two arbitrations on the go, um, but uh, uh, I, I, I sort of expected from the beginning that they would be people who'd been delisted and felt they'd got nothing else to lose. By far the most exciting area is investigations, which is where um, I, I will, if I have reasonable suspicion that the code has been breached, then I can launch an investigation and um, I, have, uh, I have full powers to demand information from retailers, to demand information from suppliers. And um, if, I, um, um, if, if, if I find a breach of the code, um, at the end of it, I can then um, issue recommendations against the retailer, which they have to then follow in future, and I have to monitor that they have adhered to that. I can actually require them to publish the details, that's the name and shame bit. Um, and um, as of um, April the 6th, I will have the power to fine retailers. And the amount I put forward to government that should be my maximum level of fine is what has been approved, which is 1% of UK turnover which um, is about half a billion pounds for our biggest retailer. So it's a pretty massive amount of money. Um, 
so I, I said I'd go into things in more detail. So the, these are the top five areas that people have, spe have, have spoken to me about since I started. One of which, um, and I'm not sure if you're not from the food sector, you may be horrified at some of these things that I'm going to talk about. Um, the, the forensics was when the retailers were going back um, up to six years using third party, no win, no fee auditors to find any scrap of email evidence using hugely sophisticated software, by the way, taking all of the retailers emails and running it through this software to find any evidence of where the word rebate, promotion, funding, um, you know, just a search on keywords. And then if they found a scrap of evidence that there was an, an email that said, you know, we, we want half a million pounds for doing this, and then they couldn't find the numbers in the accounts, were then slapping an invoice on the supplier. And the suppliers were, so this could be five years old, um, the suppliers were then struggling to get them. They were normally given 14 days to prove that that invoice was not valid or it would be deducted off their next payment when they, when they were delivered supplies. And I took this up as although that within, within a statutory view contracts, you can go back up to six years, that I felt that it was mightily unfair and that the retailers should be able to sort their books out faster than that. And I've now got a voluntary agreement with eight out of 10 of them to only go back um, two years, including the current financial year. So it's quite a big difference between the two. Um, Sainsbury's and Waitrose um, didn't sign up to it. Um, they, have, they have their reasons for doing so. And I have been telling suppliers, if you find they're abusing it, you must let me know because it's a bit unfair that all the others have voluntarily agreed to, to something and, and these two haven't if they are then abusing it. Um, drop and drive was about, um, re re particularly in the chilled sector, when you've got sort of bacon and yogurts and things like that, where obviously the speed is of the essence, that you are frequently getting lorries that will sort of, it'll be the retailer's lorry very often, that will pick up the goods, drive up to the depot, and then it will be unloaded at the depot and then split up into various other things. And the supplier will say, I've put 100,000 units on your lorry. And they'll say, well, by the time we, we split it all down, you were 100 units short, and they just deduct it off the invoice. And what the suppliers were saying that I have absolutely no way of verifying because they refuse to, they don't give me a proof of delivery, they don't do anything. I have no way of actually countering the fact that these guys are not paying for the stock that I sent them. And uh, I, when I raised this with the code compliance officers, a lot of them, bear in mind I said they were in legal and in audit, didn't necessarily understand what I was talking about. So we um, used an, an external consultant who was doing work in this area anyway to come in and speak to all the code compliance officers. And they showed them the results of a three-month um, uh, three survey when they were looking at it and counting them. And it, it is interesting that they were, they were using um, a, a consolidator. So... Um, so people would sell, send their yogurt and their bacon and their cheese to the consolidator in full pallets. So they knew what they'd sent and the consolidator knew what they'd received. The consolidator would then break it up to send a whole lorry load of mixed stuff to the, to the, um, the retailer's depot. And the consolidator picks to zero every day. So they would know at the end of the day, and they said their, their run rate in terms of errors was three in 10,000. By the time the retailers had got hold of this and started deducting stuff off the suppliers by saying this wasn't on the lorry, the error rate was over 30 in 10,000. And 20 suppliers had worked out they were losing 15 million pounds a year in this way. So that was what the drop and drive is, which as I've ra raised with the retailers is one of my top five. Forecasting and service levels, that's... Um, um, some, some of the retailers will sort of say, oh, well, you know, you should have achieved a 98.5% service level and you've only achieved 95%. Therefore, the loss of profit and the fact that I didn't have that extra, extra volume is £200,000. So please, can I have £200,000? Um, what I've been trying to raise them is, well, how good was your forecasting in the first place? Because if you've told them I want to have 4,000 4, cases a week for the next six weeks, and then when it gets nearer the time, you know, three, three weeks ahead, two weeks ahead, one week ahead, they still say it's 4,000. And then the order comes in for 6,000. Then, you know, this, the, if, if the supplier actually has given them 5,900, they've actually done remarkably well. And the weather changes. I don't expect retailers to get it right. But some of them were still fining. They were fining the suppliers £10 a case for being short. 
Now, that's all very well, but if, the, if those goods have come from Kenya, you can imagine the cost of all of this is, and of course, the temptation for the processes is to massively overorder so that they never get caught out. But the waste that you get down the supply chain by this is enormous. So I've been raising the issue of forecasting with all of them, and it may surprise you to know that only one retailer was able to give me a rock solid answer of how accurate their forecasting was. Some of them said their forecasting and their order systems were separated and they had no way of actually measuring how accurate their forecasts were. Um, and there's me saying that this is a major, major issue for me. Um, in the code, it says you have to compensate suppliers for forecasting errors. I've never met a supplier who's been compensated for a forecast error. But my point is that if you have to compensate for forecast errors, you therefore certainly can't fine for non-delivery of an order because of your forecast error. So I've, I've been sort of twisting that to make that a bit bigger. Um, requests for lump sum payments I've talked about tends to happen at year end when, um, when people, or half years, when people haven't got hit the targets that they want to. And the packaging and design charges I talked about as well, where you're, you know, um, charge, you know people have to use a certain supplier. Um, I, I have actually officially knocked off the forensics and the drop and drive because in what I have said to the retailers is I've explained to you what this issue is. You've all made commitments to, to, to improve it. Um, if I then get com complaints and issues raised about this in future, I will investigate. So from a collaborative point of view, the first time I hear about something, I will warn you. I'll make sure you understand it. I'll make sure you understand how important this is to me. But if, you, if I then hear later on that you've done it again, that's when I go into investigative mode. Um, I've added customer complaint charges to, to this as, as well and um, delays in payments, which um, if any of you have followed the, uh, the, the investigation that I've launched into Tesco, it was about delays in payments and also payments for a better position on shelf both of which are prohibited by the code. Um, in terms of my first year, I spent a lot of the time really just trying to make sure people understand the code. The code is what the code is. My job is what my job is. It's not what everybody wants it to be. And I, I don't have any, you know, it, it's, it's, I'm set up by law. So, um, you know, the majority of the press coverage I was getting at the beginning of this year was about me refusing to get involved in the price of milk. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, and then that now, and now everybody's sort of clocked that I can only do what the law allows me to do. And so now there's a huge campaign about my remit being extended. But I think a lot of people have missed that this actually was supposed to start with the consumer. So we got to understand where's the consumer benefit of me getting involved in some of these things, because that's where the whole thing came from in the first place. Um, when it, because I, um, um, because I have been working in a collaborative way, um, I, I, I decided that I needed to have a benchmark of how well the industry was performing. Um, and, one of the th and so I did a survey, and I've just, just launched my second survey just now. So if anybody's a journalist here to talk about filling in the survey is actually hugely important. But in the survey that we had last year, eight out of 10 suppliers said they'd experienced a breach of the code in the last 12 months. Now, bear in mind the code is law. Eight out of 10 said the code had been broken in the last 12 months. Um, but also, um, we asked them how they'd like me to be measured. Is it the number of investigations? Is it amount of penalties that I raise? No, overwhelmingly, people wanted me to be measured on the fact that there was a more collaborative supply chain. They want to be able to work with the retailers, not feeling that they've, they've, got, they've got to just do as they're told all the time. And so this time round, I'm working very hard to improve the response rate. And I'm pleased that almost all of the retailers have said that they will um, send the survey out to their suppliers this year, which is great because that means it just goes to everybody. I'm buying a list as well, trying to promote it everywhere I go. Um, and um, I, I, you, I, I can just see you can't read that. But um, in terms of... Uh, uh, some of the feedback on the survey was that 38% of direct only only 38% of direct suppliers said they would consider raising an issue with me. So I've been brought in to protect them, and only 38% said they would even consider raising an issue if they felt the code was being breached. <coughs> and 58% um, of them, that's what's in these blue boxes, 58% of them said that they wouldn't tell me because they feared retribution from the retailer. And 41% very insultingly thought I wouldn't do anything about it. Um, so I'm hoping for a better score on that this year. So that's only different from last year. No, this is the last year's. This, year, this year's survey only opened last week. So I haven't got any results yet. So that's your benchmark. Yeah, it's my benchmark. 
so, um, so, so my, my, my general mes message everywhere I go is to say to suppliers, you've got to let me know what's going on. I can only intervene if you tell me what you need me to be working on. I'm continually checking that the top five issues are the ones that I should be working on. And I think that's been the easiest way to do it because they might not want to tell me everything that's happening. But if I say, have I got the right top five issues? They'll generally say that I have. So I feel that I am doing the right thing. And what I've also been trying to say to everybody is that even though, I think one of the reasons we did a bit more, more work on the survey, um, on the we did a follow-up survey to try and find out why people wouldn't talk to me. And an awful lot of businesses just want to sort it out there and then. They see it as a commercial issue that needs to be sorted. So if you're asked for half a million pounds, you don't come running to the GCA. You try and negotiate it away and get something else from it. And I've said, I, I can understand you doing that. And actually, it's probably the best thing to do at the time. But you must tell me that it's happened. And that's really what I want to capture in the survey is, are things getting better? Have there been less demands for lump sums? And that's where I'm starting. I mean, I get anecdotes about things getting better, but this is where I want to measure it to prove that things are, things are going in the right direction and where things aren't going in the right direction, I know which ones are wrong and what to do about them. Um, I've deliberately not said much about the investigation I've launched because I can't tell you much. But um, as of February the 5th this year, I launched an investigation into Tesco on um, the area of delays in payments and better payment for shelf positioning. I'm at a period at the moment, I have received all of the Tesco documentation. Um, I'm at a period at the moment where I am waiting for suppliers to come to me voluntarily with evidence. And um, at, in due course, if I want to, I can require suppliers and retailers to give me more evidence. And if in the evidence that comes in, I get um, a reasonable suspicion that actually this has been going on with other retailers as well. I can expand the scope of the investigation. But in reality, the investigation is probably going to take between six to nine months. And so you can see why working with a collaborative approach and sort of finding something wrong and raising with them quickly, I can actually make quite a lot of progress. Is that all right? It's very good indeed. Thank you.